1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 9. If you're new, we've been walking through the book of 1 Corinthians. And we're about six sermons in, I do believe. And we find ourselves in chapter 3. Chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians. Let me ask you a question uh, before we dig into the text this morning. Are you progressing in your growth as a believer? Is there progress after Jesus has saved you? Do you see that? Is there evidence in your life? Or maybe are you going through a season of stunted growth? Is there a little bit of stagnation in your walk with the Lord? We need to think about that question as we walk through these nine verses together. Hear the word of the Lord, beginning in verse 1. The Apostle Paul to the church in Corinth writes these words, But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now you are not ready, for you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you again in prayer asking that you would bless your precious word. You're infallible, you're inerrant, your holy word given to us to reveal yourself, as we learned last week, to reveal your wisdom through the power of your spirit, and we need your spirit today. So Lord, I pray that you would convict and correct us, those of us that may have grown stagnant in our walk, may have, may have had a season of growth stunt or stunting in our walk with you. I, I pray that you would move us forward. And those of us maybe that are progressing, you would, you would continue to progress us through the power of your spirit. And most importantly, through my words, Lord, I pray that Jesus would be lifted up. And if there are those in this room that don't know him, I pray that you would reveal him to them that you would penetrate their hearts and that you would quicken their minds and that you would bring them from death to life. Lord, in all things, the cross would be lifted high and you would be glorified. It's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. I'll have to admit, as we just watched child dedication and witnessed those babies being dedicated, I enjoyed watching the pictures of the babies on the screens. I... I like babies. I love babies, in fact. I've had three of them. And I would imagine most of you in this room love babies. If we're honest, there's an innocence about babies. We admire them. We want to hold them. We want to touch them, squeeze them. We love watching them smile and making them laugh. We love babies because, let's be honest, when people are little, right? You understand those are people, little people. I don't mean the toys, little people, although babies play with little people. They're little people. When they're in that stage of development as an infant, they are cute, right? God designed them that way. They're cute. So we love babies because they're cute. But it would not be cute for a baby to age and progress and to develop as normal and become a toddler and then a young child and then maybe even a teenager and still act like a baby. That's not cute. It's not cute for a perfectly developing seven-year-old or eight-year-old to still drink out of a bottle, is it? I mean, there's nothing cute about that. There would be nothing cute for a perfectly developing 10-year-old little girl to still wear diapers. There's nothing cute about that. That is not innocence. That is what? Immaturity, isn't it? And we know there's nothing cute about being immature. What does that have to do with our text this morning? What has everything to do with our text this morning? Where Paul is is in his his argument, Paul is telling the Corinthians they should have grown up by now. They're developing an age, but something's off. 
Their growth has been stunted. They are very immature. If you know the dating of the book and the time that Paul planted the church, it's been five years. It's been five years since the gospel took root in the hearts of the Corinthians through the labor of Paul and the preaching of others such as Apollos and and the leaders that Paul uh, sought to raise and grow up for the benefit of that church. It's been five years. And Paul would have expected some progress to occur, but you can hear it in his voice. He's really disappointed because they are acting like a baby. Sadly, this is something that also occurs with many professing believers. Many of us are immature. Now keep in mind, what I don't mean is this. Last week we saw Paul in in, in verse, where were we? Verse 6, call the Corinthians mature. So what is he saying now? Are you contradicting yourself? Paul doesn't classify Christians as mature and immature. Notice, positionally we are mature, but practically there are seasons we walk in a very immature way. And Paul is confronting that. The inconsistency of being immature in the faith. You see, what happened to the Corinthians is something that happens to us. Many of us have progressed in age. We've gotten older. It's been years since we first met Jesus. But the problem is, our spiritual progress is still stagnant. In a sense, we have not moved beyond the milk We're still running back to the bottle. We can't chew up the meat. I mean, look at our lives. Look at the Corinthians' lives. Now, you might say, Joe, I'm pretty mature, so this ain't for me. I'm just going to tune you out, and I'll see you next week. What you have to understand, again, this is the Christian life. At some point, a mature person will be faced with the temptation to be very immature. You will be enticed by things that will stunt your growth or cause stagnation. You will be tempted to slow down, to be passive in your walk with the Lord. You will be tempted to be immature. So do not tune me out. The Lord wants to warn all of us and correct some of us through this invitation if you're taking notes. Because we are saved, that's the first part, we are called to progress in spiritual growth instead of being stunted by spiritual immaturity. Because we are saved, we are called to progress in spiritual growth instead of being stunted by immaturity. Now, for you to understand this, you have to know the context of where we're at in Paul's argument. For those of you that missed last week, you have some catching up to do because Paul closed chapter 2 with a very weighty discourse of the Holy Spirit. Very rich. He, He actually fed them some meat, I'd argue. Gave them the work of the Holy Spirit in imparting God's wisdom to us. Remember, we learned last week that it wasn't us that discovered God's wisdom on our own, but rather it was revealed to us by grace alone. So Paul wants this church to know that they're not in the flesh anymore. They're not human anymore, in a sense. They're not a natural person because they have been filled with the Spirit. Christians and only Christians can now understand the wisdom of God. They are, quote, in the words of Paul, spiritual people now. Because we have the Spirit of God indwelling us. And we're programmed now by the Spirit. Look at verses 15 and 16 where we left off. The spiritual person judges all things, but himself is to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord as to instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. The spiritual person, the Christian, can now discern, evaluate things through the the filter of the wisdom of God. And a non-believer can't do that. So they can't decipher why we live the way we do because they don't have the Spirit of God. They're operating in a human way, in an unredeemed way. And then Paul says, who who has understood the mind of the Lord is to instruct him. But now we can understand the mind of the Lord because what? We have the mind of Christ. The Corinthians have the mind of Christ. But here's the question. What happens when you have the mind of Christ but you act like a toddler? Because that's what's happening with the Corinthians. Or let me put it to you in another way, okay? Another biblical way. What happens when those of us who are filled, by, filled with the Spirit should be walking in accordance with the Spirit, but instead we're walking in accordance with the flesh? Immaturity. Stunted growth. 
So let me circle back to that question that I asked before I even read the text. Are you progressing or has your growth been stunted? You keep that in the back of your mind as we walk through this. Paul's going to lay out before us, if you'll put the slide on the screen, the, the one with the, the outline if you have it. If not, it's okay. There you go. Paul's going to lay out before us two exhortations by which we might progress towards growth. You want to move on from being immature. Here's, here's two exhortations to us. We'll see the first in verses 1 through 4 to see the problem of spiritual immaturity and the second in verses 5 through 9 to change our perspective of spiritual ministry. Let's look at the first. L look at verse 1. But I, brothers, cannot address you as spiritual people, <coughs> but as people of the flesh, as, underline this, infants in Christ, I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. Notice the verbs in this text are past tense. Paul could not, Paul fed. Paul is clearly referring to the time when he first ministered to the church in Corinth. This would have been five years prior to him writing. Remember, Corinth was a very pagan city. Right? So, so the idea of this man from Nazareth, this Jewish man, dying for sinners, being uh, resurrected from the dead and sending them his spirit as the means to redeem humanity was a new message to them. They, they were infants, so to speak, in their development when Paul first met them. He says, when I came to you, I couldn't address you as spiritual people. What does he mean? I couldn't address you as a grown spiritual person. I understood where you were in your development. You were a newborn, an infant in Christ. And, and let me tell you, it's okay to be an infant in Christ. Paul's not getting upset with them because when he first came to them, they were infants in Christ. There are some of you in the room. You're an infant in Christ. If you've been saved, you know, less than six months, I would say you're probably an infant in Christ. But even a seventh-month-old, an eight-month-old begins to start eating solid food. So you, so you can't use, well, I'm a new believer as your excuse forever. But it is okay because at some point we were all infants in Christ, amen, weren't we? So Paul says, when I first came to you, I couldn't address you that way. You were people of the flesh. Now let me clarify what Paul is not saying is he is not saying these people are not Christians. Over and over, he has already told them they are. Again, he uses the word brother. They're brothers and sisters with him in Christ. Chapter 1, verse 2, to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together. They are Christians. Again, last week, the weighty text of the work of the Spirit. You are filled with the Spirit. You have the mind of Christ. What does he mean by people of the flesh? That word in the Greek is sarkinos. S-A-R-K-I-N-O-S. -S. It's of the flesh, made of the flesh. You see, because of their spiritual age where they were developmentally, Paul knew he could not feed them the meat of the gospel. He, must have, he could only feed them the milk of the gospel because they couldn't, they couldn't process steak at this point in their walk with the Lord. The indwelling sin, and we'll talk about that in a moment, that still remained in their hearts was too great for them at that time to fully grasp the meat. So he had to give them baby bites. Milk. We all, and we all get this. I've been a parent. Again, I am a parent. I've not been a parent. I am a parent. I've been a parent of infants. That's what I meant to say. Some of you are parents of infants now. At one point, you were infants. You see parents who are parents of infants. Would it be right to watch a parent of a two-month-old feed the two-month-old a McDonald's hamburger? No, we need to call the local authorities, right? That's not what, why? Why is that not right? Because developmentally, they cannot, they can't chew. They have no teeth. You know, I'm, I'm not a, 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 a biology expert, but I know the esophagus could not take the, the, the bite of the hamburger, right, and, and swallow that thing as a two-month-old. The stomach of the baby wouldn't be able to digest it and process it. So Paul's saying, when I first came to you, you were infants, and I gave you what you needed as an infant because spiritually you couldn't digest it or process it. But again, it's been five years. Hey, if you've been a Christian for five years, it's time to grow up. Paul says by now you should have been able to handle this. You should have been able to digest this. You should be able to chew up some meat. You should be able to eat a ribeye. But look at what he says. And even now, this is the second part of verse 2. Now, you are still not ready, for you are of the flesh. You still have not progressed. You are still not able to digest meat, because you are still of the flesh. 
It's okay to be an infant. It's not okay to be immature. It's okay to wear diapers when you're a baby. It's not okay to wear diapers if you're perfectly developing 10-year-old, 15-year-old. That ain't okay. Paul says that's immature. The word sarkikos is used here. This is not the same word used in verse 1. One letter is different. There's an N in verse 1. There's a K here. This means you're operating out of the flesh. You are characterized by the flesh. What does Paul mean here? Well, we must understand something. When I say grow, I mean your progressive sanctification. Okay, maybe you're new to Christianity and all you've ever heard is Jesus died so I'd go to heaven. We've all heard that. That's a benefit. But ain't the reason he came to save you. You understand that. He came to redeem all of humanity. He came, as we just sang, to make things that were dead and broken, new and restored. He came to save you so that you would be, over time, conformed into his image, Romans 8. And then at one day you would be glorified like him. Not just so you could get a free pass into heaven and not have to go to hell. Okay? That's the cheap gospel. That's not the gospel. That is a benefit of the gospel. That ain't the gospel. So when Jesus purchased you, he meant for you to progress in becoming more like him. But here's the problem. See, sanctification works like this. When Jesus saved me, I was justified. We talk about salvation in three tenses a lot. I was saved. I was saved from the penalty of my sin. I will not be penalized for my sin. I do not have to worry about enduring God's wrath. I do not have to worry about hell. I've been freed from that because Jesus bore my hell and bore my wrath on the cross. Amen? But there's something else. As I walk out my life as a Christian, I have the Holy Spirit indwelling me. I am being saved. Present tense. Meaning sin isn't gone. The penalty's dealt with. But the power's still there. And as I walk out this Christian life, it doesn't mean I won't sin. It doesn't mean sin's not there. First John, he who says he has no sin is a liar. It means the power of sin lessens over time. And then one day I will be glorified. The presence of sin will be no more. That's what we long for. But right now we're in that middle. See, the Corinthians, the opposite's happening. This is when we know we're of the, are characterized by the flesh. We're sarkinos. You see, over time, the, the sin, the power of sin should lessen. So for some, it happens more rapidly than others. I get that. But it should lessen. But see, the opposite's happening here. It's like a cancer's got in. Instead of the cells dying, they're multiplying. The sin is multiplying rapidly. This has occurred. They should have moved on to eating meat. But because of this, their growth is stunted and they're able, unable to chew up the hamburger. Think about this for a moment. In a church that looks so spiritual, if you know anything about the book of Corinthians, you know they had long services. A little disorderly, but long services, right? Let me just tell you something. It's just because a church has a long service doesn't actually mean they're even getting anything accomplished. They had a people using a lot of gifts. Using them wrong. And they had excellent preachers. Paul and Apollos. And they were wise, boy. That doesn't mean they were mature. Paul says you were immature. You still need the bottle. What does Paul mean by milk and solid food? What does he mean? Because that is an important question to ask you. What does he mean? Grow up. Start eating some meat. We can't answer that question here because Paul doesn't tell us, but there's somewhere else we can turn to maybe shed some light on this. The author of Hebrews... May have been Paul, may not have been Paul. That's up for debate. Turn to chapter 5 of Hebrews real quick. Now let me tell you what I know Paul doesn't mean. Paul does not mean this, that the gospel is only good when you become a believer and when you die. In other words, Paul is not saying the milk is the gospel and the meat is something beyond that. Sadly, some people think that. As if you never need Jesus's death, burial, and resurrection after you're saved. Paul does not mean that necessarily we move beyond the gospel. He, moves, he means we build onto the gospel. We grow in depth and detail of the gospel. 
the meat is taking the wisdom of God and applying it to our lives. It is growing in our understanding. And yes, I'm going to say the word doctrine. That's an important thing. But again, it's not to store facts in our head. It's to allow them to change our heart and and change the way we live. That's chewing up meat. And clearly they're not doing it. Look, look, Look at what the writer of Hebrews says, beginning in verse 11. About this we have much to say, and it's hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers... You need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. By this time, you should be teaching others, but some of you need to be taught again the basics. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, since he is a child. In other words, those of you that are immature and you're still on the milk, I don't know if you should be the ones teaching others because you still need milk. This is a very important verse. I'm going to say, how do I know I'm growing? How do I know if if I'm I'm living out this teleos, what we learned last week, this maturity? Look at verse 14. But solid food is for the mature. For those who have the powers of discernment trained can filter what the Bible says through the lens of the cross. Can filter what the world is throwing at us through what God has said in his word. And by constant practice, this means this takes intentional action and application to distinguish good from evil. That's what a mature person does. And they're not doing it. Now he goes on to say kind of the milky things. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ. Let us progress in depth and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance. In other words, don't keep laying the same foundation Build on this foundation. Here we go. Here's here's some some milk that we should grow in depth and detail and it should become meat. Repentance from dead works and faith towards God. Verse 2, instructions about washings. Okay, we need to remember the audience. This was a Jewish audience. We We can see there's a parallel here to baptism. Baptism, its importance in the church. The laying on of hands. What's that, Joe? In the Old Testament, the prophets would lay out their hands on the people and what would happen? The Spirit of God would rush on them. And do a mighty work. The work of the Spirit in the life of a believer. The resurrection of the, of the dead. We believe that when Jesus returns, we'll rise with him. Those who are dead in Christ receive a new body. And we will rule and reign with King Jesus forever. An eternal judgment. Basic. Milk should be moved to meat. We build on this. We don't go beyond it. We build on this. The problem is some of us are not eating meat. Some of us are not building onto it. We're still on the milk. We're still on these elementary doctrines have not moved on to the stake and the richness of our salvation. Let me explain. Let me give you an example. Here's the milk of the gospel. And and let me say this. (coughs) What's important is you understand this. Even as you grow older, you still need milk. Right? Maybe you don't... You don't drink the milk, but you still need the nutrients that come from milk. But we add other things to our diet. So so when I say the milk of the gospel, we look at it through the lens of Hebrews, right? uh, The foundation of repentance and faith. Well, when you're first a believer, right? When when you're an infant, developmentally, to you, you you get the core of it, right? It's, It's, I need to turn from sin and look to Jesus by faith. And because he died on the cross in my place for my sins, I will be forgiven. It's true, isn't it? But as you grow, you start to see there's more to it than just that. You see the depth of it. It's not merely that Jesus just died to forgive your sins. Something else happened. When Jesus went to the cross, all of your sins, past, present, and future, went there with him. Right? Right? So he, he expiated you, in a sense. He washed your record clean. He threw all of your sins that you will ever commit if you look to him by faith in the depths of the ocean and something else happened. He was the sinless one who knew no sin, who lived the life you couldn't live. Therefore, when he died, instead of you, he took his righteousness in a sense and he imparted it to your record so that you would stand before God every day as if you lived the very life that Jesus lived. You have his record of righteousness credited to your account, meaning the Father always sees you as he sees your son, meaning he looks at you as if you lived the very life that Jesus lived, even in your worst of moments. Do you see the detail and depth of that? Baptism, 
for some of you, baptism was just a sign that you, sh you, know, you show people you follow Jesus. You haven't put it together yet. It's your union with Christ. It was a mile marker in your life. You look back at that day and remember, I am a new creation, not because I've been baptized, but because the Spirit did a work in my heart, and I believe the gospel. Now I'm united to Him forever. His death was my death. His resurrection was my resurrection. And when I witnessed a baptism, something stirred in me. That's depth. That's detail. I'm challenging you to move on from the milk and start chewing up some meat. Some of you have been a believer for years and you can't handle these things. Why? I'll tell you why. Because you rely on me to feed you every week. One meal a week is all you eat. This meal right here. And I serve it up, I do the best I can, and I put it before you and you eat it. Maybe. You don't chew up the meat of it. You drink the little sippy cup of milk. And then during the week, you don't eat. And you come back and you think that, that one meal a week is good for you. I'm good. I got this. I can fight my sin. Power of Satan. I can fight with that one sermon this week. And you can't. You can't. Do you do, do you do that with your normal diet? Do you eat one meal a week and say, I'll eat again next week? None of us do that. Start feeding your... Even a toddler can start feeding themselves. You guys realize that. When my kids were two, they knew where the granola bars were in the pantry, and they could go get the granola bar, open it up, and take a bite. Some of you start feeding yourself. So what, is it, what does Paul mean when he says, you know, or, or what did I mean when I say there's a problem with spiritual immaturity? Look at what Paul says next. Go back to the text. Paul says, For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are, not, are you not of the flesh, and behaving only in a human way? When one says, I follow Paul, or another, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? Now, why would Paul say that? Because he just told them in the previous chapter, they are not human, they're filled with the Spirit. Clearly, Paul's bringing up back the major issue, the, 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 the issue of division, the creation of cliques, because of the sin in their hearts, jealousy and strife. He's telling us if sin goes unchecked, we can be certain that our growth will be stunted. But the real problem, if we step back and look, is Paul saying you're being inconsistent. You're living as if you're, you're, you're not filled with the Spirit, but you are. That's a problem. Romans 8, one of the greatest chapters in all the Bible. What did Paul say? Verse 9, you, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Jesus Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. You need to realize if you are a believer, you have the same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead indwelling you. Now live like it. That's what Paul is saying. Live like it. Stop living like you were before you were a believer. That's a human way to live. That's a very inconsistent way to live. Let me apply this even broader. There are some of you that would say functionally, yes, I get that. I have a high view of marriage. I understand that marriage is connected to the gospel. I get that. That's, that's walking by the Spirit mentally, but functionally there's inconsistency. Because many of you husbands do not serve your spouse the way that Jesus has served the church. Many of you wives do not lovingly submit to your husband. You begrudgingly chastise him. You treat marriage as a contractual agreement when you're not at church instead of, of, of a lifelong covenant. That's just one example. Some of you claim, hey, I know God's sovereign. I was taught that. I was revealed that by the Spirit. I hold on to that. God is sovereign in all things. But yet this week, when you go and see your bank account depleted, you're going to start doing what? Becoming very anxious. And you're going to look at yourself and say, I, I better fix this. Well, wait just a second. Didn't you just say that God is sovereign? Are you sovereign or is God sovereign? Do you see there's inconsistency? That's acting in a human way. But we could go on and on. Where are you acting inconsistent with who you are in Christ? Because the reality is, you have the Spirit of God indwelling in you. You're to walk now by the Spirit, not the flesh. Paul will go on to say in Romans 8, you, you know how you do that? You, you actually kill the flesh. You put to death your sin. We're going to circle back to that in the end. You see, the problem of spiritual immaturity is inconsistency. 
You're not living out who you really are. Now, as Paul recalled the division over human leaders, he's going to shift gears a little bit, and he's going to show us as, that we must change our perspective on spiritual ministry. That's the second exhortation. Right? I follow Paul. Look at me. I follow Apollos. And look at verse 5. What then is Paul? Notice Paul doesn't say who is Paul. What is Paul? What then is Apollos? Servants. That word is diakonos. It's the same word where we get deacon. Now he's not, he's not giving them the, uh, the title of deacon here. That's not the con. In a sense, if you're, if, you, if you're saved, you're all little deacons. You're all little servants. Servants. That word actually means table waiter in the Greek. Table waiter. They wait tables. Paul and Apollos, the people you are dividing over, are actually table waiters through whom, underline that, through whom you believed. You are, they are vessels, channels, through whom we believe. God brings to faith and builds our faith through these human channels, through these servants as the Lord assigned to each. That's as the Lord gives to each. Gives their task. Gives their assignment. Notice the Lord's the one behind the scenes divvying out the task and the assignment. Think about what's happening here. They're table waiters. Think about the last time you, you ordered a really good meal at a restaurant. And unfortunately, I know that might have been a long time ago. I get it. It seems like every time I go to the restaurant, it's very difficult to get a good meal. But think about the last time. Imagine if you got that really good steak cooked just to perfection. I mean, everything was cooked perfectly. It came out on time. The temperature of the, of the food was perfect. The spices were so blended well. I mean, you just loved it. And you thought to yourself, man, I, I, need, I, need, I need to praise someone here. And you looked at the waiter. And you said, a boy. Good job. I mean, tell me what was going on when you, when you put those flavors together, when you cooked that steak. I mean, tell me, tell me the secret here. Would that make any sense? No, you would praise the chef. You see, what's happening here is they're praising the waiter, not the chef, because their perspective was off. Christian leaders, if you're taking notes, such as myself, a pastor, a teacher, maybe your small group leaders, a, a deacon, and I'm going to argue here in a minute, every one of us are instruments that serve one purpose. To bring about and build up faith, which we know is a gift from God anyway. You see, the eyes of the Corinthians were on the wrong thing. They had the wrong focus. I, I love every time, you might not know this, but I have a picture of Martin Luther's so Christie prayer in my office. And every time I, before I, I come out and and, and gather with you guys and worship, I, I pray that prayer. And there's a little part in that prayer that says, use me as an instrument. Don't forsake me. He had it right. Use me as an instrument. What, what, did, what did they think? I follow Paul, I follow Apollos, and now the church is divided, split up into these little petty groups. You know what? Their eyes were on the wrong thing. As if their identity was going to be found through their leader. I mean, we talked about that several weeks ago, so I don't want to rehash that whole sermon. But man, there is a problem when we take man or something created and we elevate them to the place that only God deserves and we start finding our identity and our purpose and our value through those things. Paul says that shouldn't be. So if Paul and Apollos were merely servants, if I'm merely a servant, who's done the real work? Who causes the growth? Paul uses an illustration from agriculture. Look at the next few verses. I planted, Apollos watered. Notice, we had different roles. But God used them both sovereignly and we complemented one another. Look, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither... He who plants nor he who waters is anything but God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one. I love this. And each will receive his wages according to his labor. He who plants and he who waters are one. They have one purpose, which is ironic because the church is divided over these guys. He said, don't you understand? We got one purpose. I might teach that way, he might do this, he might teach this way, but God is sovereignly using us, complimenting us in our gifts to bring about 
Growth. One purpose. And I love how Paul ends this here. Look, look at what he says. He who plants, he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. What a comforting thought for all of us. To know that God does not reward fruitfulness, but God rewards faithfulness. If the Lord sees so fit to bring 500 people to our church, praise God. But if there was only five, and that's what he saw fit, praise God. At the end of the day, when I stand before him, he's not going to say, how many people came and sat on a Sunday? Now, obviously, we want many people to come and hear the gospel. But he's not going to reward any of us based on fruitfulness. He's going to reward us based on faithfulness, our labor. Why is Paul saying that? Because people are splitting up into a popularity contest. And he says, my reward is not whether or not you like me or not. My reward is not whether you post my sermons on social media. My reward is not whether I get a following or not. My reward is God looking at me and saying, well done, good and faithful servant. Paul's not saying that ministers are not important, though. Compared to God... We have to put them into perspective. You see, what we need to understand is every leader, minister of the gospel, leader in the church, God invites, and you as well. We'll see in 1 Corinthians 12, you as well. He invites into participation to be used as an instrument to bring about and build up his people's faith in him and his promises. He doesn't have to do it that way. You see, God is God. He didn't have to use someone to water. He didn't have to use someone to plant the seed. But he allows us, he invites us into that. And that's the perspective we must have. So please hear me. Put the preacher, put the pastor, put your favorite. And let me just say this. You might love some guys on YouTube. And if they're teaching sound doctrine, great. But they ain't your pastor. They don't know you. And you don't know them. You're supposed to be under a pastor who can shepherd you, pastors, plural, who are accountable for your growth and your well-being. Okay? Now, I said accountable because at the end of the day, the pastor is not the one responsible because some of you have unhealthy expectations for me. And we say it because we say things like this. Oh, I grew so much under his teaching. How about you say this? The Lord used him to grow me under his teaching. Or the opposite, he was a terrible pastor. I'm going to blame him for all my failures as a Christian. Again, you should have been eating your meat during the week and figured out, hey, something's off. At the end of the day, it's God who gives the growth. It's God who deserves the glory. You know, I don't know the type of piano that Johann Sebastian Bach played. I have a feeling that Rob Bunch might know. I don't know. I don't know that piano. Maybe some of you in the room, like Rob, might. But what do we know about Johann Sebastian Bach? He played the piano. Servants, we are the piano. No one's supposed to see us. They're supposed to see who? God through us. This is the perspective we need. Verse 9, for we are God's fellow workers. I love that. We are God's. That's in the, that's, that's in the genitive. That means this is possessive. In other words, God, God possesses his fellow workers. God's a good God and says, come into this with me. I don't need you. I, I've used this illustration a lot, and it's not even in my notes, but, you know, my, my children all love to cook, and when they were little, they all, now my older girls can actually do it, but I still have a six-year-old, and he just makes a mess. You guys get it, right? And you're like, hey, come in. Let's, let's, let's make the pancakes. Do, you, do, do we need our six-year-old to do it? And we're really doing it. Like, we're really cracking the eggs. We take his hand and we, you know, open up the eggs. We take his hand and we stir it. It's the same thing. God don't have to have us. We're his fellow workers. I'm his fellow worker. Pastors, the other pastors, you're his fellow workers. Servants, body, you're his fellow workers. It says we are, we, the church, you are God's field, God's building. We're going to talk about God's building next week. If you'll put the slide on the screen. This is from our study guide. That next slide, do, do you have it? You can take a picture if you want. Or if you don't have a study guide, grab one in the back on your way out. Those are our gifts to you. That's the perspective <coughs> we're to have. Right? God is behind our growth. He is the one who receives the glory. He is the one we adore. He is the one we should honor. He is the one we should magnify. He is the one we should lift up. 
No human should rob God of the glory due to him. No preacher should try to gain a following. And you shouldn't look to a preacher for your identity. What a great reminder to all of us. In a sense, we're all servants. If you're a believer in Christ, you are a servant. Mark 10. We should all be laboring and ministering to one another. Wherever God has placed you, your job is to, number one, be faithful. Be faithful. And it might be hard. Like You're like, man, I have, I have continually tried to disciple my kids, and they just don't seem to get it. Keep doing it. Keep doing it. Remember, we learned last week it's the Spirit that does the work anyway. Keep doing it. Be faithful. Be a channel. Be an instrument so that people would come to know Jesus and grow in Jesus through you so that Jesus gets the glory, not you. This is the perspective we must have. Spiritual maturity occurs when we have this perspective. We don't want to end with Paul's statement there. You are God's field. We'd be remiss to miss what Paul is saying here. Two things. We are not individual plants all by ourselves. We're God's corporate work of renovation. He's going to go into that next week. And he chose to use the imagery of a field. Think about it. Before you came to know Christ, what were you? You weren't in the field. You were a dead branch. You were a dead thorn. A bramble bush in a, in a barren wasteland. You weren't a part of a field. The, the picture here is a beautiful, thriving field. The lilies, the flowers budding, right? Because growth is happening. Growth. Before you came to know Jesus, you were the, the, the detached, dead branch that nobody wanted, right? That's what you throw in the fire and you burn. But God said, I'll come and I'll save that branch and I'll make it my field. I'll come and I'll rescue that rebel to make them my own, to grow them and mature them because Jesus didn't save you so you would be stagnant, so that you would be stunted in your growth. He saved you so you would over time progressively start to look like Him. You are His renovation project and behind it all we see that God is growing us making us into something beautiful. And yes, he uses human ministers and leaders right, to do that. But he is giving the growth. He is the one that gives life. Why? Because he is the one that died so that you would grow. John 12, I'll end here. John 12, Jesus talking to a few of his disciples. Listen to what Jesus says, beginning in verse 24, well, only verse 24. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. What's he talking about? Himself. He's the grain of wheat. If the grain doesn't go into the ground, the seeds don't scatter, and the plant doesn't, I mean, sorry, the, the field doesn't come into existence. But because of Jesus and what he did for the brambles, what he did for the thorns, what he did for the dead, the, the, the dead limbs were part of the field. He went into the ground, church. The God of creation condescended to us, came down to serve us. He shouldn't have served us, but he did. He did something we didn't deserve to happen. He did what we couldn't do. He upheld the law in our place. And then he said, I'll go and die for that rebel. He can't save himself. She can't save himself. But I'll take their sins. I'll take their guilt. I'll take their condemnation. And I'll bear it. I'll bear the weight of their failures. I'll take it on myself. And he did that. He poured out his blood for every ounce of pride. He poured out his blood for every drop of inconsistency in your heart. He shed his blood for, for every wrong word, every wrong motive, every wrong deed you have committed or ever did commit. The God behind our, our growth said, I'll die so they'll grow. And now we are his field, his beautiful project, growing together to display his glory. And you know how I know that? Because Jesus was placed in a tomb, but he didn't stay dead, he rose. Right? The receipt we needed to know if our payment was actually taken and accepted was not made through a physical receipt. We signed our name. It was sealed by Jesus' blood and the receipt is the empty tomb. And then some days later, what did he do? He ascended and he poured out his spirit upon every believer so that through the power of his spirit we would be sanctified. We would grow into his image. Number one, come into the field. Some of you are still a dead branch. 
reserved for the fire of judgment. I'm sorry, but that's the truth. But that don't have to be. The judgment can be reverted to Jesus and you can be a part of the field. Turn to him by faith. Number one, if, I'm sorry, number two, if you were in the field, Jesus didn't save you to be a thorn. He didn't save you to be a stagnant plant. He saved you to be a thriving member, part of his field. So as we close, I have two points of application. Number one, check for signs of stunted growth. Do a little diagnostic check. Are, are you growing or is your growth stunted? And here's how you know your growth has been stunted. If there's a lack of love for God's word and God's people, you're in a season of stunted growth. Just is, you are. You're part of a field together with other, other believers. If there's apathy in your heart, you're growth stunted. If you have a legalistic view of spiritual disciplines, in other words, if you think that you have to earn God's love by reading the Bible, you're, you're growth stunted. Man, you missed it. You should want to read the Bible because God saved you, not because it earned you anything. You earn absolutely nothing through your efforts. Let me also ask this, is the time on social media and your phone more important than chewing on meat for your growth? Stop looking at what people ate yesterday for breakfast and lunch and start actually eating meat for yourself. Stop wasting time. Is comfort and convenience more important than being in gospel community with the church centered around the Bible? That's kind of immature. Like, we're called to sacrifice some things. It ain't easy to be a Christian. Sometimes you got to give some things up. But it's for your good and your growth. And lastly, do you have an unhealthy expectation of spiritual ministers? If the band would come up. Secondly, pursue growth. Maybe you say, I am grown, but then can keep it. Keep pursuing growth. Continue to prioritize the word. Secondly, trust chewing up some meat. You know, we have a whole resource center back there full of books that are vetted by your elders that we say, hey, go, here's some meat, eat it up. If you want to know what some meat is, ask us. I mean, again, this isn't doctrine just store in our heads. We don't believe that. We believe when you learn more about God and what he's done for you, it should change the way you live. That's meat. That's walking out the life or your new life in the spirit. Keep pursuing others with Jesus. I'm sorry, keep pursuing Jesus with others who are in the field. Are you doing that? Keep doing that. Keep putting sin to death. Keep continually putting the lust, the bitterness, the jealousy to death and saying, look, that's not me. That's my old me. That's inconsistent. My new me has been redeemed by Jesus and I have the spirit of Jesus living in me, the one that raised him from the dead is in me, I can put my lust to death. I can put my porn habit to death. I can put my bitterness, my jealousy to death. I can put my coveting to death. Put it to death. If you'll stand.